let's get started. So welcome back for the afternoon session of the first day of the Meet the Fellows event for fall 2022. So we have two sessions uh, in the afternoon. And uh, in the first session, we have four talks. And the first talk would be given by Soik Tara, who has changed the title. Uh, but I, you know, he says underlying math is the same on spectral algorithms and power of two uh, spectral algorithms. Mm -hmm. So it's latent recovery in complex networks with missing data. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Shovik. Uh, I'm now a research fellow here. Before coming here, I was a postdoc, from the postdoc at uh, MIT Math Department and Microsoft Research New England. So I would like to tell you some uh, recent results of latent recovery problems in complex networks, especially when you have missing data on the network, okay? So first, uh, uh, let's see an example, which is classical, and it relates sort of the clustering problems and latent structure recovery problems on networks. So this is uh, the Belgium telephone network, uh, where edges represent people calling each other, uh, nodes, are, uh, uh, nodes are people, and uh, you can see that there are clearly two separated clusters in the network. And it turns out that these two separate clusters represent the two largest linguistic groups in Belgium, the Dutch speaking population and the French speaking population. Okay, so uh, the thing to note here is that if we can do clustering on a network, then we can figure out uh, hidden traits of the nodes that are present in the network, like which language that they speak, right? So in general, uh, communities are densely connected parts of the network. And uh, usually we are given an unlabeled observation like this. We don't know anything which are communities. And from that, we have to construct back the communities. And uh, so we want to divide the graph based on an unlabeled observation and this is an unsupervised learning task. And as many applications in especially data mining, for example, if you look at uh, building better recommendation systems uh, or web page sorting algorithm, as well as in order to understand how a different anatomical segregation of human brain works and also uh, how to give you friend suggestions in social network like Facebook. Community direction underlies uh, uh, all these problems. And for so many applications, there has been a huge development. There has been many fundamental results in this direction. And it is a now well-developed field. But most of this literature you can find is in the context where you have full information about the network is available. Okay. However, in practice, that is often not the case. We often have censored data in modern contexts, and that can arise due to reasons like privacy, noise. And in many cases, we don't see the network. We only see the network by some sampling procedure. So there is always a partial observation of the net network, and we have censored data. And there are two questions that we can ask here. The first is, when is recovering uh, cluster recovery of clusters possible or impossible, right? Depending on uh, whether you care about deleting the information uh, of communities, you would probably care about the impossibility part. But if you care about recovering communities, uh, uh, you would care about the possibility part. So this question, the answer to this question is kind of a two-edged So From a more computational point, uh, yeah, the important question is, are there scalable algorithms for community detection? And we want to find algorithms that are optimal in the sense that whenever it is information theoretically possible to do the recovery, the algorithm should be able to find it. Okay. So this was high level. Uh, so now just should to show you some concrete results, let's uh, consider a generative model which is simple, but we will see that already in this simple model, if we have sensory, we will get some different behavior. So each vertices in this model are assigned to one or other community with some probability rho, and edge probabilities in community one or two, they arrive with probability P1 and P2, and between communities, they arrive with probability Q. And additionally, we have the censoring. So each edge is revealed to us with some probability T log N over N. So most of the data is missing. Only log n over n uh, uh, many data is revealed to us. And this t parameter is sort of controlling how much 
information has been given to us. And we observe this unlabeled graph and between each pair of vertices, we either know the connection is censored, present or absent. The question here is to find the communities exactly. Uh, we want to find an estimator such that it is exactly equal to the true community assignment with high probability up to a global flip. And there are two cases uh, that are quite popular. Uh, people look at uh, the symmetric case where the edge densities are equal in two communities. And also there is a famous problem of planted dense subgraph problem where uh, you hide a smaller dense subgraph inside a larger graph. Uh, that case you get when you take P2 equals Q. Now, let me uh, very briefly mention a few approaches. Uh, the first approach one can try is to do some maximum likelihood estimation. Usually they yield optimal algorithms, but maximum likelihood estimators usually are NP hard to compute for this problem. So natural approach is to take some SDP relaxation of the maximum likelihood estimator. Well, in some regime, uh, this uh, Hayek Wu and Shu paper shows that the, this SDP algorithms can be optimal. However, even though SDPs are uh, polynomial time, they are not as efficient. And I also should mention that these prior works have uh, conditions like the edge densities are equal and you also have this condition like P plus Q equals one. Okay. So our interest is to see how do more efficient algorithms such as spectral algorithms perform uh, because spectral algorithms have much better running time. Uh, so we want to see how would these algorithms perform uh, in the center, censored setup. So this is the class of spectral algorithm that I, I will talk about, spectral one algorithm. Uh, so you first encode the graph using some matrix, right? So if there is a censored connection, you put zero. If edge is present, you put one. And if there are at, it is absent, you put a minus y. So we have three types of information. That's how we encode it. And then we compute the top two eigenvectors and plus then compute a linear combination of these eigenvectors and classify ver vertices according to whether this linear combination is more than subthreshold or less than subthreshold. So this is uh, a class of algorithm that is well studied in the literature. Usually it works uh, up to the information theory threshold if you don't have sense any. Okay, so here is the first result. Uh, we first find the information theoretic threshold, meaning we find an TC such that if T is less than TC, you cannot come up with any algorithm for the uh, this exact recovery problem. There are no algorithms, okay? On the other hand, what happens if T is more than TC? Well, uh, in the symmetric case and planted dense subgraph problem, the two problem I mentioned in the beginning, it turns out that spectral one algorithms are optimal. They work up to the information theoretic threshold. Okay, so this is a, these two are cases of success stories for spectral one algorithm. And now the question, are spectral one algorithms always optimal? Yeah. Or two minutes, okay. Are spectral one algorithms always optimal? So it turns out that, uh, those were the only two cases. If you take any other case, spectral wall on one algorithm will not be optimal in the sense that if you are sufficiently close to the information theory threshold, they don't work no matter what choices of parameters you take. Okay. And you might think, is this a sign of computational versus statistical gap? Uh, and the answer is no, and there is a good news. Uh, we can devise an optimal spectral algorithm. Uh, by instead using multiple encoding matrices instead of a single encoding matrix. Okay, on the same data, we can use multiple encoding matrices to boost the performance of spectral algorithm. Okay, the idea is very simple. We just take two spectral, uh, two encoding matrices on the same data, right? And now instead of two top eigenvectors, we have four top eigenvectors and play the same game. Uh, take linear combination and classify vertices according to if this linear combination more than or less than. And this class uh, always succeeds 
up to the information theory threshold always for any parameter regime. And not only that, there is a bonus. So this spectral two algorithm class turns out to be not as sensitive to the choice of encoding matrices. For example, as long as this encoding parameters uh, are not equal and they lie outside a finite set, then spectral algorithms always work. So this makes spectral algorithms quite robust. And uh, the takeaway is that spectral algorithms can be effectively boosted by using multiple encoding matrices on the same data. Okay. So I would be very happy to chat about uh, the, the interesting open questions come up here and also uh, what are the intuitions for seeing these results offline. And, but for now, let me thank you and end with the reference. Thanks for the lovely talk. Questions? Do you have any beliefs or results about what happens at criticality? At TC? Okay. I, we don't have any results, uh, but uh, probably my conjecture would be that uh, it is possible, but that depends on the situation at TC. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, how does this algorithm, spectral algorithm, compare to the message passing algorithm, the more traditional ones for like community detection? So in this case, also we studied uh, one of these two-step algorithms. Uh, so in the two-step algorithms, uh, it turns out that there is no gap. They always work up to the information theoretic threshold. So they are kind of like the spectral two algorithms. Maybe Jason, you can set up. Well, any questions? Anyone else? Um, could you explain the uh, the test to decide uh, which how to label a vertex? So you said th th you said there are these two eigenvectors. So 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 I should I, tr should I interpret this as like I look at the i th value mm -hmm. of the eigenvector to determine if node i yeah. is yeah. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll sneak in a quick question. So how uh, important is that uh, censoring probability? You said it's log n by n. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so in this case, uh, we are considering the exact recovery uh, and we initially have a dense graph. So uh, the, for the exact recovery, the final stage, final thresholding happens at this log n over n scale. So if you have uh, larger than log n over n, you can always uh, detect. Uh, it using spectral algorithms. So it, actually for spectral one algorithms even, it does not work up to the information theoretic threshold, but if you pick a uh, very large enough T, after that, uh, the spectral one algorithm still works. It just does not work up to the information theoretic threshold. Okay. So thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering how, how do you set the gammas? Are they learned? Uh, um, so the gammas, once you have fixed y1 and y2, you can compute it explicitly. Okay. So there okay. are some equations you have to solve in order okay. to Thank you. find the right gammas. Let me take the remaining question. Oh, when you go ahead. Question. So uh, I'm curious about what the special is. How does it compare to the exact recovery in a uh, Can we repeat the question? So the question is, uh, what is the information theoretic threshold? Yeah, what is the threshold? So uh, the threshold, I did not write it, uh, but it comes in terms of some churn of filling the distance between two uh, distributions. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Okay, the next talk is.